This is the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Weather Lounge. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller, and I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast. We have a brand new episode every two weeks and come to you from our Weatherworks headquarters located in Hackettstown, New Jersey. And joining me as always here in the Weather Lounge is my fellow prognosticator and co-host, meteorologist Mike Mahalik. Hey there, Mike. Hi there, Brad. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Don't you know I'll read anything on the teleprompter? Oh, I forgot. I'm like, I'm like Ron Burgundy. Ron Burgundy. Uh, yeah, well, that was just so we could kind of <laughs> chit-chat before we got into the basics of the podcast here. I didn't think you'd read that, Mike. Come on. Man. Oh, well, you know, it's uh, it's like it's like when he uh, calls out San Diego. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, well, and, uh, let's not, we'll, we'll let's, not say that on this no, podcast, no, but if no, no. anybody knows the movie Anchorman, well, I'm all right, sure lesson you know learned. I won't about. put that in there. I'll have to type everything out for you, Mike. Okay. Anyway, today we're going to go back and talk about weather basics a bit and talk about the features of a surface map and some tools that are used to forecast the weather. And, you know, I think it's important that people know, you know, what's on a surface map. Right. right? Yeah, I mean, we're not going to talk about the deep dynamics and the equations that, uh, you know, we derive when we're learning meteorology and what meteorologists have to actually study to uh, get their degree. But, you know, more of the stuff that folks see every day, um, you know, whether it's on television and, you know, even elsewhere, the Weather Channel. I mean, yeah, I'll say the Weather Channel on the Weather Lounge because, again, I think everyone's watched the Weather Channel, including myself. And that's what really got me into, you know, meteorology as a a younger uh, person. And, um, you know, I go back to the surface maps and I think I like the old surface maps on the Weather Channel. And, uh, you know, it just kind of always caught my eye, and uh, that's kind of what we're going to cover here in this podcast. With the speckly snow and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I used to love that stuff. <laughs> well, I don't know where you're coming from, because I thought we were talking about differential and ordinary equations. Oh, differential yeah. equations. No? Oh, gosh. I remember all those we're not gonna uh, talk about classes. That? Thermodynamics, and uh, what was the other one I had trouble? I actually had trouble with one of them. Um, I can't remember the name of the course, though. Atmospheric well, dynamics? No, no. Uh, I'll have to think of Vector that. calculus. <laughs> that was, I don't think I had to take vector calculus. I remember well, it's, uh, it's calc three for most. I remember PDE, which was partial differential equations. I had to take that, oh, too. Partial and ordinary yeah, differential yeah, equations, was, right? Yeah, well, again, we're not going to talk about... <laughs> we're not gonna we're talk losing about the, our audience. The classes I got C's in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, too. But, hey... You know, but let's let's talk what Brad was talking about. We're going to go with the surface map here, and I think we're first going to start with high and low pressure. I mean, it's the most obvious things that you see on a surface map. You see your big blue H, you see your big red L, um, and basically, what does that mean? What does high pressure mean? What does low pressure mean? Well, high pressure is just what it says. It's an area of high pressure. There's nice weather underneath that. Um, You're going to have lots of sunshine, maybe a few fair weather clouds. That's kind of what goes with it. Circulation around high pressure is in the clockwise direction. Yeah, make sure you get that right. (laughs) Um, We're in the northern hemisphere here. Yes. Southern hemisphere, it's the opposite, and that's due to a whole bunch of other fun stuff with the Earth's rotation that... Including toilet flushing? Now, I don't think that's an actual thing, I honestly. Well, uh, I, I, th- I think there was like tests on that done, and they, they always say it goes that one way or the other, but uh, I don't I, know I, if it's true. Not to get too far off of uh, course here, but I remember a Simpsons episode. I mean, I still like the Simpsons, but not as much as I did probably 10, 15 years ago. But there was an episode where they got stuck in Australia, and at the American consulate, they actually had a toilet that would turn the flushing to clockwise. <laughs> I don't, again, I don't know. This if is a very obscure reference to The Simpsons. It was a machine that I was don't built into the toilet it. to make it flush clockwise so you, you felt like you were at home. So anyway. Back to high pressure. Yeah, go back to high pressure. Okay. So high pressure, clockwise rotation around a high pressure. So, but what does, why is there nice weather in high pressure? Well, it's because there's a lot of sinking motion within high pressure. So as you, as air sinks, you know, there, the air dries out, it compresses, it turns into high pressure at the surface. So you really don't get clouds and things like that building up because in order to form clouds, you need the air to rise and you need the air to, uh, the water vapor in the air to condense um, and form those clouds. That's where low pressure comes in here, Brad. Um, and the low pressure 
just what it says, lower pressure at the surface, we're going to have rising motion within that low pressure, and that's going to create your water vapor to condense and form the clouds and form your rain and your snow, sleet, whatever it may be. Um, so low pressure basically is equated to bad weather. And, and usually air flows from high to low. Yes. And well, there's counterclockwise flow around a low pressure system in the northern hemisphere. We're not talking about the south again. Um, but yeah, Brad's exactly right. Your air flows from high to low pressure. Um, so and they're all they all work hand in hand. All the systems, mm -hmm. high and low pressure. As high pressure exits, usually low pressure is moving in, yep. and that you know again, and that's kind of what we watch for on the weather maps. Now, now in between the highs and lows, Mike. There's usually another thing that we'll see on the weather map that's almost every, no one can miss, and that's the fronts. And, you know, the, the, the two big ones are cold fronts and warm fronts. And usually in between the highs and the lows, there's a frontal boundary, and it's a change of air masses. You know, the high may be pushing into the low. It may be a little warmer on the low side of things. And then there's a fresh push of cooler, drier air with the high pressure that builds in behind usually the cold front. And again, this is more a common, of course, you'll see uh, in the winter is more of a discrepancy, I think, between temperatures. But even in the summertime, you know, you get out of that hot, humid air mass that's, uh, you know, been baking across the Northeast. Maybe it's been in the 90s and it's been humid. And then, you know, you get that nice cold front to come through in the middle of July and it kind of freshens the air mass and drops the humidity. So that's kind of what we're talking about with the cold front. And I think everyone understands the differences between the two. And it also can make a big difference between, you know, snow and rain, obviously, in the wintertime. Now, on the other side of that, you have a warm front usually connected to the top part of a cold front. And also that will usually, uh, you know, have a transitional area, especially in the wintertime, where you're going to get rain on one side on the warmer side of the warm front, but then you usually get snow on the northern side of the warm front because what happens is as the warm front moves across the area, it's a lot less dense than the cold air. So it rides up and over the cold air already in place. So kind of remember that the cold air is very dense and it's a little more uh, it's a little more tough to kind of scour out, if you will, versus like the warm air that's kind of rising over the cold air. And that's usually what produces a lot of precipitation. And it's a lot of times along that warm front and where the cold front's set up. So, uh, you know, and we see that a lot of times in the wintertime with uh, what we call overrunning. Yeah. And just going back to actually the symbols on the map. So your uh, cold front is going to be a blue line with um, blue triangles on it. You know, that's what you'll see demarked demarcating is that the right word yes yeah sort of um the cold front but the warm front is the red line with the semicircles on it um that you'll see and where they intersect as brad mentioned before that's where your low pressure is going to be located and, and one thing to note too and there is a reason for those little triangles and those little semicircles and it shows you actually the direction that the cold front and the warm front is moving so you kind of get that idea. Usually, you know, if you look over the eastern half of the United States, you have that cold front with the little triangles pointed towards the Atlantic Ocean. That means that's that's the direction that the cold front is moving. And in, you know, warm front cases, you have those semicircles uh, on the top of the warm front, meaning that the warm front is moving northward. Now, in between, though, sometimes you'll get what's called a stationary front. And that is when there's the battleground set up. You have a warm and cold front that just don't want to budge one way or the other for like the easiest way to describe this. And they just kind of fight it out. And yeah. it's basically, you know, it may waver a couple of maybe miles north and south over a day or two. And uh, again, this is something that we deal with a lot in the wintertime here in the Northeast, uh, the stationary front. And again, it could make a difference between, you know, maybe a half an inch of rain where there's nothing going on. And maybe north of the stationary front, you get three to six inches of snow and even some freezing rain mixed in. So uh, the frontal boundaries play a big, big, uh, you know, yeah. forecast. Big battle part in the for forecast, right. for sure. Um, and a lot of times with the stationary front, it, it'll almost maybe begin as a cold front diving down from the northwest, and it might be running into a high pressure over the southeast, and it kind of gets hung up, mm -hmm. and it gets uh, strung out over, let's say, you know, the Ohio Valley and through the Mid-Atlantic or, or just for a general location. Um, and 
when you have those stalled out boundaries like that that are stationary fronts, sometimes you do get these little ripples of low pressure that ride up along those and bring you know more extensive right. precipitation. Um, it's almost like a little highway for the low pressures to follow. Yes. Sometimes you'll get like a stationary front draped over an area for two, three days, and you'll get these areas of low pressure to ride right along it, and it'll just follow it like a highway. And then, uh, like Mike said, we'll get a couple of uh, rounds of precipitation, whether it's snow or you know rain. And, it, you know, it happens even in the summertime. You get these stationary boundaries. And sometimes that could, uh, you know, be the difference between a cooler a more maritime air mass like over New England where it could be stuck in the 60s, even in July, in clouds, and then you get down towards like New Jersey and it's into the 90s and it's hot and humid. I don't know, Brad. Earlier, did you explain what type of precipitation is usually associated with a cold front? Oh, well, yeah, I guess we can talk about that because, you know, along the cold front, in the summertime, a lot of times you'll get, uh, most of the time, you'll get thunderstorms along that cold front. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that that's going to be like Brad was talking about earlier. You're going to have your hot and humid air mass in place, you know, just ready for something to come along and trigger some clouds and and thunderstorms. So a lot of times the cold front is that trigger Um, and it's a lot steeper than the warm front would be. Um, So that cold air really kind of knifes in. Right, it does. Um, It undercuts the warm air in place. First at the surface and then up. So right, so it's going to create that vertical motion very quickly, and that's how you get your thunderstorms developing. Whereas a warm front is a more gradual shift um, with the warm air overriding. So you mostly, you're going to get your stratiform rain, which is more like your, you know, big area of rain. It's not your thunderstorms. Like to moderate rain, just kind of a, you know... But persistent rain. Enough about fronts. Wait, wait, we got one more. I forgot. No. We're going to go to it. Yes. Mike no. didn't really want to talk about this. Nobody because, knows what an occluded well, front is. I'm going to try to explain it, and, and I'm not going to really <laughs> explain it that long. But basically, sometimes you'll see this on the service map. It, it's more like a purplish color. And it's really, it's, it's a mixture of the cold and warm front. So I guess red and what? Yeah, red and blue make purple. Right, So right. for that matter, you'll see... You'll see a portion of the storm system where there's a triangle and a semicircle, and that's basically what's called the occluded front, and it's when the cold front catches up to the warm front. Now, the weather probably doesn't change all that much, but it's just a a meteorological term given to when this happens. Yeah, and this usually happens when your your surface low becomes... it Vert- to, vertically stacked right, is like we call it. And, so yeah. it's gone through the development phase. It's into your it's decaying, mature phase, right. and now it's it's basically stacked on top of each other. We like to call it, and it just starts kind of weakening a little bit. Um, so you know that would be an interesting idea. I wonder how many listeners out there have heard occluded front. Yeah. If you have, send us an email, weatherlounge at weatherworksinc.com. You know, and I'd be interesting to know how many people do know that. Um, I want to name my kid Occluded. Occluded? Occluded. Well, you remember that? It sounds like a dog name. No, you remember that Seinfeld episode when Kramer wanted to name his firstborn Isosceles? Isosceles. Because he liked the word Isosceles. I like the word Occluded. (laughs) I already have a couple kids, so I don't think I'm having any more, but. Occluded, the the ED is throwing me on Occluded. I don't know. But you're if right. I, it's a good dog. It's a good dog name for for a large meteorologist. You're right. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about temperatures. Um, so on a map, there's a lot of times um, lines of equal temperature. Right. And those are called isotherms. And um, so basically, you know, if we're analyzing a map, we have a lot of observations that do come in from various airports and stations across the country. And we're going to look at, you know, what each one is showing us. And we're going to draw lines between those stations that are all about 70 degrees. Yeah, kind of. But, you know, more difficult (laughs) (laughs) because... (laughs) You don't know exactly, you know, which ones are at 70 and which ones are at 80. Right. Um, but, um, you know, that's how, you know, in the old days before we had the computers right. and stuff like that, you would have a blank piece of paper and you'd have to physically draw out your isotherms. And the good thing about those is that it'll show kind of your change in air masses that Brad was talking about with the fronts. So you'll be able to see where those isotherms get really close together, and that's called the temperature gradient, and that's typically associated with either a warm or a cold front. 
Yeah, and you'll see that off the coast of uh, the Northeast when we have a big snowstorm even because a lot of times the coastal areas could be, you know, in the mid to upper 30s and then you don't go too far inland and it's into the 20s. So you get that real tight gradient like Mike was talking about. And a lot of times that's what feeds off uh, or at least allows the... Uh, um, the uh, the nor'easter the baroclinic the, zone the baroclinic zone kind of yes that's what it's almost like the winter the summertime with the uh, hurricanes where hurricanes feed off the uh, warm Atlantic waters or ocean waters uh, Gulf waters but in the winter time these cold core systems they feed off the temperature gradient or like Mike just said the I like that the uh, Baroclinic zone. Baroclinic zone. Well, that's the technical name. I so I thought I'd throw that in there. All right. Well, um, you know what? Let's go over to the same thing with uh, air pressure, barometric pressure. Same idea with temperatures. These are called isobars. And you'll see that on uh, almost all weather maps. And they'll basically go around the high and around the low. And same thing here. When they get really close together, especially on a low pressure system, uh, the isobars get really tightly packed. And the gradient on the pressure is so strong that it, it becomes windy, and that's a good idea where we have a good idea where it's really windy between yeah. the high and the low. So make it make it easier to, to kind of picture, since this is a podcast, think of a real strong area of high pressure. That's like 1040 in millibars, and then you have an exiting area of low pressure off the coast of uh, New England that's like 990 in, uh, in millibars, very strong. So you got like a 50 millibar pressure gradient between the two storms and a lot of times the highs moving a lot faster than the lows moving out so in between there you get a lot of wind and packed isobars and that's what kind of drives the weather and uh, that's why it gets very windy like in the northeast after a snowstorm and the high pressure starting to build in Um, yeah and that's definitely a good way that forecasters can look at a surface map and know you know which areas are windy and which direction those winds are coming from based on your circulation around um high and low pressures you can find the highs and lows too when you when you do the isobars and the uh yeah same thing like i was talking about with the temperature map you're going to do the same thing with pressures and you now, know, Mike, I'm gonna put you on. I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Oh, don't! It's not on the rundown. You got a light board or something? No. What <laughs> is? What is? You know, we had isotherms for temperatures, isobars for pressure. Okay. And I'm kind of looking for the answer because I can't remember exactly what oh, it's called, no. but maybe you know what is an equal line of dew points called? It's like isopleth. No, that's just the generic term for a line of equal um, something. Is an isopleth. Oh. Um, it's isodrosotherm. Isodrosotherm? There you go. Thanks to Mike Priante, our producer. Yeah, yeah we got it from our uh, special tech guy producer in the corner. Yeah, I knew it was, I, I should have done a little research on it. I knew, I've heard Come it before. Come on. You bring that up for me. Because I, I knew it was a funny Isodro- word. How many times do you use isodrosotherm? I don't think I've ever used it. <laughs> I just know it was a funny word because I remember seeing it before. Well, it's a, you know, you said equal dew point, correct? Right. That's what we're talking about. So it's funny that you bring that up because sometimes we have something called dry lines. Right. Um, That's another one. And dry line is almost like a cold front would be. However, we're not talking about temperatures here. We're talking about drier air pushing into air that is more moist. Right. So... You don't see that too often here in the Northeast, though. No, typically this happens in Texas, right. um, where you're getting a lot of dry air coming off the deserts uh, in the Southwest mm-hmm. of the United States, um, and you know Texas obviously has the the more moisture coming into the state from the Gulf of Mexico uh, and the tropics. So a lot of times you have that move in that can force thunderstorms to develop too, with that difference in dry and moist air. Right. It's usually like a little. It's almost like a dashed line, I think, that they use on a lot of service maps. Um, you know, there may be a cold front out in like New Mexico. And uh, as Mike said, though, but, you know, ahead of that, you get that dry line maybe going across Texas and it'll help to drive uh, the severe weather as, uh, you know, the, the, the drier air again goes up against the warm, moist air coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. So it's uh, it's something that we don't see very often, definitely not in the Northeast, you know, maybe once in a long while you have a dry line, but again, it's... Yeah, I don't know if I can recall one that happened up in this area. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's tough to get that just because of where the terrain is, is built. But shifting gears, we also have hurricanes. They have their own separate little symbol. Yeah. It kind of looks like, uh, 
how would you describe a hurricane symbol? Hmm. It's like a a circle with two barbs coming out of it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what it would look it's like. It's red. <laughs> yeah. It <laughs> spins like, clockwise. Like, no, counterclockwise like, in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, it's like we're playing some kind of weird game here right now. Okay, name something that's red. It has barbs. Uh, now there is a difference though when when map. that when that when that circle's filled in or it's not filled in. Yes. You know, it's filled in for the hurricanes, but when it's open, it's still a tropical storm. Tropical storm. Right. So you're you're talking about a storm with uh or a tropical system that has winds that are under 74 miles right. an hour. Now, I remember I think I remember even on the weather channel on tropical depressions though, even though it's not a name storm, it would be like an italic L. Yeah, I think they used to have a, a like a little L or something with it. Right, it wasn't um, like a typical low pressure, but it was also yeah, just to differentiate. <laughs> remember yeah. that? Yeah, no, I do remember uh, things of that nature for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the symbols that we use for hurricanes um, since, you know, we needed something. Yeah, well, <laughs> So we figure we make something that looks like a pinwheel uh, right. a little bit. That makes sense. I mean, it spins out there and then it um, kind of shows where the location of a, of a hurricane or tropical system is. That's true. So another thing that we find on weather maps at times are airport observations. Right. If, you, if you're looking at a more, uh, I don't know what I would call it, uh, more of an aviation map right. or, or, or something like that. Um, and they take observations and they put them into these little symbols on the map and they have wind barbs on them. And yeah, those this are quite is, interesting. This is a little more technical meteorology though, but yeah. not, not to the point where it's like, you can't understand it though. It's something that right. you know, a lot of folks probably have seen before, like you said. So what, what you'll have is you'll have a, uh, a circle on the airport itself and that circle could be different colors. And then you'll have a line coming out of the circle uh, and that line is denoting which direction uh, the wind is coming from. So if the circle has a line pointed to the northwest or, you know, the left more, um, you know, that's going to say, hey, your wind is coming out of the northwest. And then on there, you have your barbs, too, that show you how strong that wind is. And there'll be a long line or half about half the size of the long line also on that. And it almost looks like a little flag right. uh, on there. Each line is 10 miles. Uh, oh, I guess, no, 10, 10 knots. knots. Right. Correct. The half line's five knots. Yep. Uh, and then if you get into the, the triangle that's filled in. 50. 50 knots. So if you see a triangle, then a couple of lines, and uh, you, you know it's, it's, it's going to get pretty windy. I, I like it when an error occurs, and there's like three <laughs> yeah. triangles and a couple of lines on there, and you're like, well, how did it get to 170 yeah. miles an hour on yeah. that wind gust? You know, it, that's crazy. We're not on Mount Washington. We're talking about Newark. Right. And most of these, <laughs> yeah, because most of these are computer censored things. And, and sometimes they yeah. do, uh, they do have a, a little issue. But we use those as meteorologists every single day, and especially in the wintertime, because we're trying to find out like where the freezing line is and where the winds are coming from, because that may actually help us to forecast, you know, uh, you know, when we do our forecast here at WeatherWorks, um, you know, determine where a freezing rain event may occur or where it's going to be all snow or where there could be ice forming on the pavement, even after, you know, a, a system has gone on by. So, and how fast that temperature may be dropping down below freezing in the wintertime. So it helps us as meteorologists. These are some of the, the current weather tools that we use every single day and especially in the wintertime. Yeah. And there's also something called METAR code, which we won't go over here, right. which is associated with those observations. But basically it's a big long string of, of numbers and you know letters and 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 sim and stuff like that, which will um, tell you exactly what's happening at that station. And you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff to review on that on how to decode those METARs. Um, I learned how to do it. I know you did, yeah, uh, Brad. Um, I think most meteorologists do learn uh, how to decode those METARs. Yeah, and there, but there's if you're really interested into that too, and I still do it to this day because every once in a while I'll see something that's like, oh my gosh, I, I don't even remember what that code is. There, there's a lot of decoder websites out there, and all you have to type in is like decode METAR, and you can actually cut and paste 
uh, you know, maybe a, a raw METAR and you pop it in that little window and it'll tell you, you know, in common terms, you know, what's going on. It's partly cloudy, wind is this way, you know, and, and what, there are some odd terms too, like, like FU is smoke. <laughs> I thought I was about to just uh, totally cut you off. No, right like Mike, hit the button, man. <laughs> well, I mean, like S is yeah. snow, you know, R A is rain. But yeah, there's some you need weird a five ones. second delay on Brad. <laughs> there, there's some weird ones out there. Oh my goodness, <laughs> am <Yeah>. I wrong? <laughs> no, you're not wrong. There, there are. Well, think of one. What's some... another? What's another funny one? I don't know if there's another. F- that's the most. That is, yeah, that's the one. That, interesting one oh, that, see, that I can you, think you of. You look at it and you're like, oh my god. I gosh. mean, they have, yeah, but <laughs> is the Mitar, uh, is, it, is it? Yeah, it's interesting. But I got a question for you. Uh-oh. Maybe, maybe our uh, our producer can help out here. What does Mitar stand for? Hmm. Ah, it's an acronym, right? And it stands for. Yes, I, I probably learned this a long time ago. Meteorological Aerodome reports. Meteorological Aerodome reports. Met AR. Yeah, yeah. Met AR. Wow. There you go. Man, I have not heard that since I was no. probably at Penn State. Yeah. Um, getting my degree. Yeah, it's one of those <laughs> that was things. A long time ago. Yeah, that you probably learned in the beginning of your meteorology uh, education that, you know, you don't really need to use down the road, but just one yeah. of those fun things, um, you know, that you, you learn somewhere along the way. It's like it's like radar is an acronym. Radar for really. is an acronym. You're and right. People maybe a lot don't know that, and I think that's uh, radio detection and ranging. Is that Something correct? Like that. I think that's what radar stands Mike for. Mike Priante is looking this up. Google it, Mike. I think I got that one right, one hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, it is radio detection and ranging. Ranging. Ah, okay. see, I did get it right. Radio yeah. detection and ranging. Perfect. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of acronyms in weather that we do use. And even when you don't even realize something like radar is yeah. an acronym. Well, yeah. And again, and that's something simple on weather maps. We kind of skipped over that precipitation. I think everyone understands, you know, uh, the white areas are snow and, you know, the green areas are rain. Those are the two easiest ones to pick out. In between that, you'll sometimes get some pink, which can either be on a weather map uh, freezing rain or sleet, and I think some some uh, maps will use a little darker pink color or a lighter color for differentiation between sleet and freezing rain. Um, but you know, the, basically, those are the four colors you're going to see on a radar satellite. I think everyone understands. You know, where there's clouds, you'll you know you'll see the 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 cloud cover versus where it's clear under high pressure. You got a lot of clear skies, low pressure. You got a lot of clouds. Now th- there are a couple of different satellites you'll see now, Mike. We we have two in particular that we use every day, and probably a lot of folks see, and that's infrared versus visible. Yes. I mean, you got the one that's uh, infrared is you can use it all the time during day the, or uh, night. Over at night, at time, you know, uh, things like you just see the clouds. Visible can only be used when there's daylight and there's sunshine above the clouds, which there always is. Um, but and it just helps us a lot of times. Um, and probably visible is a little bit more useful in the summertime because it really depicts some of the clouds that are building quickly, cumulus clouds that can get up to 40, 50,000 feet versus a, a visible shot in the winter where it's just kind of low, low level stuff. But uh, one thing in the visible, that you can see in the winter, though, Mike, that you can't see with an IR is snow. Of course, yeah. it's not not snow falling, but snow that is yeah, already snow falling. on the ground. Yeah, and yeah, it's always interesting when we get a big snowstorm across the Northeast. You know, it usually clears out pretty well behind those nor'easters, so it's really cool. Yeah, um, to see where exactly the heaviest snow fell because you can see that nice, you know, white stripe kind of going. Uh, along the ground where where that fell, and that's uh, that's interesting. And I usually like to save those screenshots because they're a yeah. good thing to throw and, out and on it, our it, Twitter and things of that nature. Yeah, and you can usually catch like a good uh, line like between where there's a lot of snow and there's like no snow. You can like a lot of times see that in South uh, Jersey and going down towards like Maryland, and you can see where the snowfall cutoff was. And it's uh, like Mike said, really cool. And we can uh, yeah, and I mean the the. The, I'm trying to think of the word, the the clarity, that's what I'm looking for, right. on these um, visible images now are so good. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look close, you can see Brad's house. And, yeah. yeah. No, you don't <laughs> no, <want to> see. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, I mean, the clarity is way better than it used to be because we just, you know, launched not long ago some new satellites right. um, to to get those images very clear. Well, and um, even on the satellite stuff, like we have other tools that are used within the satellite. Instead of the IR and the, the visible, there's like night vision ones where you can see low, really low clouds, which yeah. usually tells us there's some fog there or even some drizzle. And that's helpful in the wintertime, too, because if you have fog or drizzle at like uh, 28 degrees, you may have some problems. Problems. Sure. So I'm going to put you on the spot now, uh-huh. Brad. Uh, we just talked about a bunch of you know, weather map things, but since you've been in the broadcast uh, meteorology industry, <laughs> yeah. uh, you were on TV uh, for a little while. I don't know how, but um, yeah, I know. I, <laughs> now, I have a face more now for podcasting than TV. <laughs> yeah, I, I can second that. But anyway. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about these future trackers that I always yeah. see on these uh, local news stations. What exactly is going on? Yeah, with so those? so far what we talked about in this podcast is like current tools and and things that we look at, you know, every hour to help us forecasting. But you know, on the other side of things, we do use weather guidance. Yes, meteorologists do use models to look at certain storms and certain setups. Now, we don't base all of our forecasts on this. Again, it's just guidance that changes actually quite a bit from run to run. And not only do we, you know, use this, we do we use our current tools that we go with and just our meteorology uh, meteorological experience. Um, you know, just as you forecast, you get better and better. Um, but we have to still have some kind of a guidance and some models to kind of show us what's going to happen maybe a day or two out. And even more so when you get into long range stuff, you look at trends and teleconnections. But, you know, when you get on things like television and, you know, you'll see the meteorologist on TV using future trackers and uh, kind of showing you the weather that's going to happen over the next 24 to 48 hours. And it's not just something that is derived from what we would put together as a meteorologist. It is actually the the model itself. And a lot of times, you know, the meteorologist will say, hey, here is the GFS model for the upcoming storm. And notice how it trends the snow off the coast at this hour. Now, let's take a look at the European model and look at the difference between the GFS and European. Look at how much slower the European model is with this storm. In this case, we're going to get four to eight inches, but in the GFS case, we're going to get six to 10 inches or vice versa. And now here comes another model that we're looking at, the NAM. This one only has one to three inches. So, you know, and and it's, it's kind of fun to show all this different stuff on TV, but it comes down to the meteorologist to make that decision of, Who's handling it best? You know, what are the current conditions right at this moment versus what the model is showing in a day or two? So, and that's where the experience comes in. You know, anyone can can show a, a future tracker and a GFS model and say, oh, we're going to get a foot of snow. It, it's in the next run, it changes in six hours. So, you know, it's all more eye candy as you look at the television stuff. It's cool to look at. And, you know, it's uh, just something that kind of pops. But you got to remember that it's not, verbatim it's not what is definitely going to happen and it's just more of uh, you know something that you can show for everyone and it's good to show the different models because that's kind of what we deal with every day mike and as even you know here at weatherworks you know we got to de- determine which model may be handling things right and then we got to throw in our own expertise right yeah i mean it's not all just reading the models and when we're talking about models we're not talking about fashion models <laughs> just so everybody knows no, we're just there. mentioning these are forecast models right. which are modeling the uh, atmosphere the, the gfs um, and euro there's the two two yes. big ones that are used by yeah, just so about every meteorologist when you hear a european model don't think of yeah. you know <laughs> just somebody who lives in i don't know germany yeah um so um, there is a German model, though. Um, oh, that's right, the Icon. Yes. I uh, Yeah, I, I'll use that from time to time. Yes. There's a lot out there, <laughs> and there's even some developed by private companies like uh, Panasonic yeah. and, uh, oh, what's the other one? Um, uh, something like about Thunder. Um, uh, oh, my, man. <laughs> Deep, Deep thunder. thunder. Deep Thunder. That's it. Thunder, you know, so that's, um, you know, certainly some other models out there by private companies that do very well also. Yeah. But that, that's a usually a, a big portion of, you know, a meteorologist's forecast on television or even on some apps you'll see. But, you know, again, don't, you know, these things change so frequently and, you know, don't, don't say, oh, well, you know, one model run has 12 yeah. inches for this area. Then the next run comes by and you have two inches and it goes back to 10 inches. Yeah. So again, you, you can't, you, that's where you got to trust the meteorologist and, and you got to take the, the, you, the ex- 
you can't hang your hat on right. one model, Ever. even if it's the the Euro model, which is you know very good uh, at what it does, and it, you know it's not infallible. It's right. not the be all end all of of modeling here for weather. Right. Um, just because the Euro shows something. You know, doesn't mean it's always going to happen. And and it did, of course. You know, it 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 did call out the the hurricane Sandy to make that hard right. westerly turn, as opposed to all the other miles that were basically taking out to sea. And then all the other miles caught up to the Euro, and you know, eventually they all had to go into New Jersey. But I'll tell you, this past uh, summer, uh, the summer of 2021, the European model has been a little bit behind. And it's not been as good as it, you know, usually is. Yeah. And I think Sandy is the one that really kind of coined the term uh, King Euro, a lot of yeah. people like to say in the weather enthusiast communities. And, because uh, we never thought a storm could ever do that. Yeah. And, and it was just amazing. I remember seeing that storm right. and, and, and even, you know, talking to our, our president and CEO, Frank Lombardo, about Sandy and, and just saying, Frank, like, how's this all going to work out? And he's like, Mike, I haven't seen this in my life as a forecaster. And we're talking about over, you know, at this point is probably 40 years experience for Frank um, working with weather. Um, so that was quite interesting. That's when I knew we were in trouble also when it was something that he's not seen uh, in the past. So, um, yeah, so that's... The future trackers, yeah, they're, they're helpful. They're, they're, like I said, right. more eye candy. But, again, you can't sit there and just uh, expect it to be right every single I'll time. I'll tell you and, what. I think that uh, GFS is coming around a little bit, yeah, though. Yeah, it has. Well, it's had some uh, <laughs> It's had some upgrades. No? Yeah. Our producer saying no. <laughs> <He's down. laughs> so I will uh, pass on that statement. And, yeah, that, uh, that's a whole new can of worms. Uh, a lot yeah. of meteorologists, uh, it's, it's uh, a, <laughs> what's, what's the word I'm thinking of? It's uh, not a bone to pick. It's a... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. But, you know, beyond those weather models, I think we have one more thing that I think we could hit on here uh, as far as what is on a surface map, and that is weather watches and warnings. Right. I mean, the watches, you know, we'll see them a lot in the summertime. A uh, big yellow box over a couple of states usually means a severe thunderstorm watch. I mean, the colors sometimes change from one place to another, but uh, you know, usually a yellow box means a severe thunderstorm watch and you get into the red boxed areas and that usually means a tornado watch is in effect for that uh, particular area of the country. And, uh, you know, sometimes if there's a real strong cold front, you'll have, you know, five or six severe thunderstorm watches lined up up and down the East Coast just based on that cold front as it, you know, gets towards the coast. And if it's, uh, you know, got enough turn in the atmosphere, then the... Uh, uh, the Storms Prediction Center will, uh, will issue a uh, tornado watch for a certain area. Right. And let's just kind of talk about this, reiterate it one more time. When you have a severe thunderstorm watch or a tornado watch, it just means that conditions are favorable for thunderstorms to become severe or to have tornadoes associated with them. Um, so that's just a watch. When you get your warnings, that means it's time to take cover. That means something has either been spotted or there's been observations of gusty winds or observations are in of inch plus diameter hail. Um, so that's when you have to take cover and you have to take action when you get your warnings. Right. And you'll see these watches, you know, like we said, cover maybe two to three states when there's going to be a widespread chance of severe weather. Uh, but these warnings that Mike was just talking about, again, we've covered this in weather terms. We've covered this in severe weather before. But, you know, your warnings are usually a portion of these watches and maybe only uh, covering two or three, four counties uh, based on, you know, who's going to be uh, most directly impacted by a certain storm that may be producing, uh, you know, strong winds or hail or, or even a tornado. And then, you know, you get the last thing you get your other watches, you get flood watches. And usually those are uh, depicted by a large uh, green area, you know, maybe covering a half a state or a couple of states. And usually that, you know, will let you know that flooding or flash flooding is possible with a certain system. Yeah. I mean, in some rare circumstances, we, we do get something called flash flood emergencies. Right. Uh, Unfortunately, we had to deal with a few of those with uh, yeah. Ida this past summer. Yep. Ida definitely had that um, with its uh, rainfall that was occurring, you know, three inches in an hour's time yeah. or, or more in some cases, I think. Um, so, you know, certainly... Um, something that you have to heed if you ever get a tornado emergency or a flood emergency, right. 
that means there is a real big problem, not just your typical uh, warning right. um, and, that you'll see. And then, of course, you get your other watches in the winter. You get winter storm watches uh, that'll usually cover, again, same kind of typical areas like a severe thunderstorm watch would. It'll you know cover a few states and uh, you know a larger portion of an area. And a lot of times that winter storm warning then will be, or the watch will be upgraded to a warning, and usually for the same uh, area. And uh, as a kid, you're always like, oh, I got a winter storm watch in my area. And today's Sunday and tomorrow's Monday. I probably won't have school tomorrow. Yeah, I always used to get bummed, though, if I had a winter storm warning and then it got reduced to an advisory. Uh, I yeah. knew that it was going downhill. Yeah, and I was just yeah. like, oh, I'm not going to get as much snow. Yeah. But I can't think of any other watches that are off the top of my head that are like, I mean, other than like hurricane watches and things oh, like that. Oh, there's but, a lot of them yeah, out there. there. There's dense fog advisories. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, all there, there, there's everything. Um, I, I think that another watch that I am just got across my phone is my uh, lunch watch because I'm getting hungry. Oh, <laughs> well, there you go. Um, <laughs> and I think it's uh, progressing to a warning well, here. Well, you know what? Because- <laughs> before we end this, though, before we end this, and I've seen this on social media before, um, when you try to explain a watch versus a warning, and this I, I love this. They'll show like a taco watch and they'll have the <laughs> yeah. taco shells, the meat, the lettuce and all the condiments yeah. all separated. But then you have a taco warning and it's yeah. actually all together right. the ta- <laughs> ready to be eaten. So <laughs> yeah, there's a good, a good way to remember the watch. All the ingredients are there yeah. for a watch. But when the warning occurs, it's happening. I think I've saw uh, seen a, a similar thing with like spaghetti yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. You know, all the, you know, the box is there and the water is there and, you know, the. You know, but it, it's yeah. all right. It's time to eat, I guess. Yeah, time for lunch. That's for sure. So, uh, hey, thanks everybody uh, for joining us on this podcast about things on a surface map. And uh, remember, we'll have new Weather Lounge episodes every two weeks. So certainly uh, come back and listen again, and also catch WeatherWorks on social media. So until the next episode, thanks for listening. <laughs>